So, good morning everybody, good morning viewers, and welcome to this week's Shed Adventure. Um, got the cup of tea going. Oh yes, that's, that's grand. Right, so what are we going to talk about? Well, we're going to talk about the 1960s, 1970s. We're going to talk about the early days of British climbing. Some of my heroes, and we're going to look at some of the, the almost ridiculous equipment that um, brave fellows like Don Willans and, and Joe Brown, probably the, the best two climbers of the, of the 50s and 60s, um, that just took UK rock climbing 10 years ahead. In one, two years, it just moved. It wasn't It wasn't evolution, it was revolution with these guys. Um, my heroes, they've inspired me. Um, and uh, we'll look at some of the uh, the kit that helped or indeed hindered them. So British rock climbing, um, if you want to sort of look at the history of it, where did it first start? 1886, um, Napes Needles, part of Great Gable up in the lakes and a guy called um, Walter Perry Heskett-Smith, had to write that down, Walter Perry Heskett-Smith, uh, an old Etonian of all things, and he was the guy who climbed Nape Needles and really put rock climbing um, on the map. A rope very much like this, a horser laid rope, but it, this is nylon, it would have been hemp, a hemp rope, natural fibre, absolutely useless, you may as well have used your your mother's washing line. Um, but that's the start of it. And it developed, but really, when Joe and Don Willans came along in the, in the 50s and 60s, they really they really pushed the uh, pushed the envelope out and all the great climbs, famous climbs, were, was, were put in over that period. So, what have we got? Well, this is set up for winter mountaineering, mind you. But there we go. Anyone of my age would recognise that. You've got your Carrymore rucksack. This is just canvas. It's got a great big bottom made out of leather. You've got a couple of old ice tools on there. You've got your crampons on the top. They're tied on with a bit of baling twine. And you've got your great big, horrible, Viking 12 mil, 150 foot, hawser laid rope, as stiff and as nasty as you can get. So let's have a look at the sort of things that the guys would have been carrying in the day. We open up the top. First thing that come out, yeah, pair of wool socks. Um, huh, <laughs> probably knitted by your mum. In my case, pair of wool socks that need darning. So um, both heels need darning, so they'll go in. And uh, my darling wife can sort those out. Why? Why? Why socks? Spare socks? Actually not. Very likely that the rock will be greasy and the boots or, we'll come on to it in a minute, the pimpsels. We are talking old-fashioned pimpsels that you're wearing will be skidding all over the place. So quite often the guys would be carrying spare set of socks to put on their, over their normal socks and they climb the climbing socks. So you need a spare set of socks. Um, well, you wouldn't go anywhere without your whistle. In case you needed rescuing. I'm sure we all know. The old-fashioned British three blasts of the whistle with a minute silence. Or the international six blasts. Say, so winter mountaineering. Huh. You'd have your pair of Dachstein mitts. What are these? These are wool. And what they've done is they're knitted gloves, they're knitted oversize, and then they're boiled. And for anyone who's put a jumper into the wash and boiled it, two things happen. They shrink and they felt. They turn into this close weaved um, wool. It's got some oil, it's not waterproof, but it's got an oil factor to it because it's wool. Um, but these are what the guys climbed Everest with. They're that old fashioned in, in, in terms of make. Um, Hillary had these. If you see pictures of Doug Scott on the top with Dougal Haston, they had these. Um, they will keep your hands warm, basically, in any conditions. If you're winter climbing, they will literally look like covered in ice and snow. They just pick up snow, um, but it stays on the top. 
And even if you put your hands in water, there will still be an element of, of warmth given by Dax Steins. If you want a great pair of gloves, get a pair of Dax. Um, you'll never be let down. Uh, hand warmer. And, uh, yeah, you wouldn't go anywhere without your silver compass in the day. So that's the sort of stuff that a mountaineer from the 60s would have. Let's have a look inside. Because what I want to focus on, I want to focus on probably some of the climbing equipment. Um, we'll look at tents maybe in some of the clothing. I'll tell you what though, there's one thing. If I'm talking about uh, Don Willins and Joe Brown and hard northern climbers, can't do that without me flat cap on. This is the uniform of a 1960s hard northern climber. He wouldn't be seen dead with a with a hard hat on. Um, this was all the protection he needed, and that was his flat cap. And there's fabulous pictures of Don and Joe in the Alps climbing ridiculous things, just wearing that. So here's our rope. We'll put that there for the minute. And of course, oh, torch, rubber torch, head torches haven't been invented. U2 batteries, weighs a ton. And of course, there wasn't such a thing as Gore-Tex in those days. How did we manage before Gary Gore-Tex? Well, we either got wet. Well, we always got wet. We either got wet with rain or you got wet with sweat. So here we have... 1960s, 1970s solution to rain, rubberized nylon pigal. Oh my word. But you were warm and wet if you had that on. Ah, here's some interesting stuff. So let's get this out. This is what I really want to talk about today. The gear. So, the first thing in the 50s and the 60s, and even when I started climbing, that everyone would have, would be a sling. You'd never go anywhere without one big, in this case, Kermantle wrong, Horsalade sling. In later life, everyone will remember the blue sling if you've got anything to do with climbing that everyone still uses today. So, there we are. This is a beaut. Viking. Viking sling. There we go, look at that. Lovely bit of rope work. Lovely bit of leather. So you'd put it over a spike or a flake and you'd put that at the sharp bit to stop it rubbing, two bits of leather, so you could make sure your rope didn't run through, and you could get your old steel carabiner, pop that on that, and pop your climbing rope through it. Put that over a flake, and you'd be, you'd be sorted. So that really was back in the 40s and 50s, and you wouldn't see any climb on the crag without that round him. And then what? Well, horrifically, to protect you when you climbed, in the certainly in the 40s, early part of the 50s, um, you needed to jam something in the rock so you could put in what's known as a runner. So the rope would go up to the runner and then you would go up. So all you could fall was the distance you were above your last runner, your last piece of protection. But what did they have? Well, you needed to jam something in a crack or put your big, your big sling over a spike, but of course, as people like Don and Joe were pushing up the limits of climbing, they were climbing things that didn't have big flakes anymore, didn't have big handholds. You were jamming your fingers into cracks. So to get a runner in place, they would literally stick pebbles. They would jam a pebble into a crack and then they'd feed a sling round the back of the pebble and that would form that would form a runner. So they'd walk up to the bottom of the climb and they would literally pick up stones and they'd start sticking them in their pockets. And quite often people would have a favorite one. 
then they try and get it back after the climb. And that's what they used. And that was their, that was their level of, of protection. Now, obviously, people like Joe Brown and, and Don Williams and others, we don't really know who, uh, who had the idea, but these are all working lads. These are all plumbers. These are all work, guys working in factories. So it didn't take long until someone's working in the factory went, I know, I'll get a nut. And what I'll do, I'll thread a sling through it, carabiner on the end, and that is better than a pebble. I can just have this, and what I'll do, I'll get several different sizes of these, and I'll hang them on my, I'll hang them on my sling, like that. And then when I want to use them, I'll just come up and fit that, jam that into the crack. Then I can attach the climbing rope to that and I've got a good solid bit of protection in. So that's what they started doing. Um, that's a steel nut, but they started using brass and copper ones because um, they're a bit softer. Uh, and you could just put the nut through and put a big, a big um, stopper knot on the other side. Or you can just thread it through like that and put a double fisherman's on it and you're sorted. And that's what they did. Um, what they would do, this one's still got the thread on it, but the clever guys um, working in the factory with the machine shop, they'd machine out the, they'd machine out the thread. Um, so we had nuts. And that would be what the guys were climbing on. And that was considered cutting edge stuff. Um, and then, of course, people thought and life moved on. And I never climbed with pebbles. And I certainly never climb with a nut. So we're now talking, I would be mid, early, early 70s. So the next, the next thing that came across were, were nuts. This is a hexagonal nut. Um, yeah, number four from camp. Um, so basically another version of, of the nut, but... On a wire, imagine that, that is not that strong. That wire will never snap. And again, you can find a crack and you can jam that in the crack and you can, and you can climb. So they'd have a whole, a whole selection of, uh, of nuts on their, on their belt. But they did have a, they did have a problem. Here's a different one. Um, Sometimes when you've got the nut in the crack and you've got a wire, there's no give on the wire and you can be climbing and it's not impossible for the, for the carabiner and with the rope to flick, your, flick it up and it drops out. So the next thing was a, was a quick draw. So you would put that carabiner on there and then you put another carabiner on and then put the rope through here. So if you look, if the rope is flipping about that, that little quick draw there stops the movement here and stops this being jiggled about. So that was the next level of climbing when I was sort of, well, early, early 70s. You just clipped in. You didn't, you didn't think about these didn't even exist. And then the quick draw, the quick draw came along. And that was what you used. And you have a selection. Look at that beauty. That seemed some action, that little diddly one there. That fits into all sorts of... All sorts of things and occasionally <laughs> I had a ridiculous thing called a bong look at this <laughs> and and you could take that and you could you could wedge that into a massive crack um, and that was one of those things I'd love to get that in uh, you felt so safe if you had this huge thing um, people did laugh though uh, it was one of those bits of equipment that I don't think ever sold. They might have sold one and they probably sold it and they probably sold it to me. So that's what the guys used in the very early days. They started off with pebbles, jamming them into cracks. They then went on to, on to nuts and these are still... These are still called cool nuts today. Um, and then they got a bit clever. And if you see a climber climbing today, you'll recognise that. He will, he will have something that looks even now. So, you know, I'm talking about 
I must have bought that in, in the very early 70s uh, and that wouldn't look out of place on what they call a climber's rack. And they would have their sling on like this. And then as we've spoken about before, they'd have this tied around their waist. And we've discussed the, the bowline. But can you imagine, can you imagine that round your waist and you fall on that? You'd have it obviously tight. It just beggars belief. So quite frankly, they couldn't fall. One of, one of the things that held mountaineering back was the guys, they wanted to live. Um, and falling really wasn't wasn't an option in those days because it was going to seriously hurt or damage you um so they didn't push it as hard as they could or hard as they do now uh, and we'll come on to in a in a future program how this then developed into um the sit harness which is what we see today um and then we'll talk about some of the clothing people wore um and then we'll start having a look at some of the boots. And then I've got over here a 60s tent, a thing called an Arctic Guinea, very famous tent. You really had only a few options if you were going into the mountains in the, in the uh, 60s and 70s. You were either a Van Gogh Force 10 man or Blacks of Grenock. They made two, two great tents, the Arctic Guinea and a thing called the Mountain Tent, A-frame tents, and they were the thing that, uh, that you used uh, until geodesic dome tents came along in the uh, in the 80s so there we are a quick scoot through some of the some of the history of um, how we got to uh, where we got today and how the uh, the hard men of climbing moved from jamming pebbles in a rock to engineering nuts to proper 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 chocks on uh, on wide chock stones um, and the good old sling, which, yeah, is still used today, although you'll see a, a blue, a blue nylon sling. There we are. So I think what we'll do next time is talk about some of the clothing um, and just see that really they were climbing the stuff in the sort of clothes that you and I will probably be doing the gardening in. So I hope you enjoyed this quick episode. Um, if you did, please like and subscribe. And um, I look forward to uh, next week's Shed Adventure. Thank you very much. Have a lovely bank holiday. Bye-bye now.